most creative pros that I encounter are just winging it. They're showing up every day and they're relying on their talent to get them through. But talent gets you a seat at the table, maybe, right? But your daily practices are what keep you in the game. That, my friends, what you just heard was from Todd Henry. Todd is one of the most talented and prolific people that I know around, around helping creators and entrepreneurs frame problems, solve the problems that we all have, and get our best work out in the world. More from Todd here now. Mr. Todd Henry, welcome to the show, bud. Nice to see you again. Thank you. It's really great to be here. You're, to, to be back, to be clear, you are a repeat guest. Absolutely. Are you, you not? Absolutely. You know what's funny is, uh, you know, I think last time we were in person, right? We actually got, I got to sit we down were. with you uh, in LA, I think, and that was a really fun mm-hmm. experience. And, um, you, know, you know, you look just as good virtually. You do. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, cameras, you put the, the blur, the blur on there, you know, it makes everyone look five years younger. <laughs> um, nice to see your face and congrats again. Uh, new work, which is one of the reasons I love to have you on the show. Anytime you put something out, it's very focused on the, the creator, the entrepreneur community of which this is a, you know, that is the focus of our audience. Most of, most of the folks who are listening and watching, identify as creators, entrepreneurs, uh, people who want to maximize their performance in the world. And obviously the creative aspect is in line with both of our values. That is, you know, one of our highest callings in life is the pursuit of that. Um, but for those who uh, might not be familiar, didn't listen to our previous recording, uh, for, for whom you may be a new subject, uh, orient us in your universe. You know, who are you? What do you like to think and talk and write? And work on. And that I think will help us get into the discussion. Yeah. So I've spent the last two decades of my life either leading teams of creative professionals or working on books and content and materials. And that includes podcasts and other things uh, and you know, teaching and speaking um, about how to be creative under pressure meaning how to show up every day at work and solve problems with limited resources, with people that maybe you don't always enjoy working with, uh, with whom you disagree often about ideas. Um, We could talk about that a little bit uh, later, but um, I primarily focus on what it takes to show up and be prolific, brilliant, and healthy every day as a creative professional. Aha. Well, for those folks that don't identify with the creative professional aspect, one of the things that I love about your work is that there's the idea and specifically with this new work, the idea of being creative is actually a daily, it is not a thing that you occasionally do, or even, you know, for someone who is outside the area of a uh, historically thought of as a professional creative, that we all are creative as a, um, as a default, default mode of being human. We're, we're, we're co-creating this conversation right now as an example. So, you know, I do love how you've put your arms around creativity with a capital C as, as has been a, a point of my mission and vision for the show and for my work, but maybe that's why I like you so much <laughs> because, <laughs> well, I think, but it's, you know, there, there's a lot of share, there's a lot of overlapping Venn diagram of, of our world. I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, I think that is why we feel some sort of sympathy, I think toward each other, because a, we are both yeah. creative pros, meaning that we are problem solvers. We're professional problem solvers, you know, and, and yep. for a long time before you were doing creative live and all of that, you know, you were a photographer and you sort of did, you know, which by the way, the funny thing to me is, I know you primarily through, you know, Creative Live and some of the other things that you've been doing in that space for, you know, as long as you've been doing it. I mean, I knew you through the other things as well, but I have a neighbor, I think I've told you I have a neighbor in my community who is a photographer. And I mentioned off the cuff one time that like I was going to be talking with you or maybe you commented on one of my social media posts or something. And I mean, seriously, it was like his head exploded. He couldn't believe, he couldn't fathom (laughs) That there was a universe in which you and I would possibly <laughs> interact in any way because you're such a like a mega star, right? So that was kind of, that was oh, kind of fun. Um, anyway, but this is this is not why Todd is on the show, folks. He's not <laughs> let here. Let me tell just you to three f- other things that are my- awesome about Chase. No, okay. Um, but you know the the this, funny thing is, like I think that I think people who 
have to go to work and solve problems under pressure and who have to, whether it's a writer, designer, an engineer, right? A lion tamer. Like, I don't mm -hmm. care what you do. If you mm -hmm. have to solve problems every day, you're creative. You have to be creative under pressure. Mm -hmm. People who have to do that, like we recognize the, the battle wornness, I think, in one another. You can almost look in somebody's yeah. eyes and it's almost like, you know, in a much less lesser way. It's like sort of when you see a veteran who's sort of, you know, been in battle. It's like when, Seen two, some duty. Yeah. when two, two veterans see each other, they sort of recognize like, okay, there's something. They have that like, you know, 50 yard stare yeah. or whatever, a thousand yard stare in their eye. I think, you know, creative pros recognize that and they respect that in one another um, because there are two, really two descriptors, right? There's creative, which is what everybody loves and everybody wants because we all love to be creative. We want to be creative and come up with ideas. Then there's the professional part of that, which means we have to show up and do it whether we feel like it or not. We have to show up and produce whether mm -hmm. we're inspired or not. We have to ship mm -hmm. stuff sometimes that maybe we're not 100% proud of. Why? Because A, it's what the client wanted. B, it's what the budget dictated. C, it's what the timeline dictated. And sometimes we have to get comfortable with just shipping stuff that we put our best effort into, but that we're constrained by and that we just have to sort of let go out into the world and find its place. And there's something unique about that, um, that, that creative pros share, I think that understanding of what it means to have to make stuff up every day and, and ship it, you know, consistently under pressure. So, um, I agree with you. I think, I feel like our worlds have overlapped a lot, but I think the biggest part of that overlap is the understanding of what it takes to just show up and do the work every day. It, indeed. And uh, I will sort of add another feather to your cap, which is this latest work that you've put out. Um, which is called The Daily Creative. Mm. Uh, it's a book, um, and it is out as of this recording. And or I know we're going to turn this really quick to try and time it as fast as we can with your with your publication. The the idea that we this is a daily activity that it is a habit, you know, not a skill, a process, not a product. Being creative, showing up to use your words um, that you have double down on that in this latest work is something that I want to dig into. Uh, and before we do, you know, narrow the aperture, I'm going to broaden it just for a second. And you, you, in your description of your own work, just a moment ago, in sort of your intro salvo, you talked about, you know, leading creative professionals, being one yourself, creating content, writing. Um, one of the things that I love about you and what I think listeners and watchers should know is this, what I would consider sort of this 360 degree view that you have undertaken over your, you know, career. You talked about a couple of decades. I didn't know you started when you were six. Um, <laughs> but, but I this, am, you know, the, I am almost 50 <laughs> years old, Mr. Jarvis. Just there, to... there you go. There you go. Well, this 360 degree perspective is something that should make people really listen mm. to this episode because as someone who identifies as a creator, has a history of putting out lots of other books, Hurting Tigers, Die Empty, The Accidental Creative, Louder Than Words. These are four amazing titles. If you don't, if you have not read those books, you ought to. Um, but as a writer of books, as a doer of podcasts, and as a manager of other creators, where not only are you solving problems, but you're managing the psychology, that makes you expressly, um, I think, qualified to speak on this stuff. And this is why people should pay attention. So, well, you know, um, I think there's, that's a, first of all, thank you for that. That's very kind of you to say, I, I think there is a precision that comes with experience and with maturity, right? Um, you know, you can talk around things. Maybe when you're newer in the marketplace, you understand some dynamics, you can talk around things. But I think the longer you're in the marketplace and the more things you experience, the more precise your language becomes and therefore the more helpful it becomes. When you can give people mm. words that describe what they're experiencing better than they could describe it themselves, I think that's when your, your advice becomes helpful. To people. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately, I've been able to introduce some language into the lexicon of creative prose that I think has helped people understand, or at least describe some of the things they've always suspected to be true, but didn't really know for sure how to talk about. And so I appreciate that. And I think, again, it's like if, if you were talking with somebody who's very experienced in your craft, you're going to talk about it in a way that's going to resonate very deeply with them because of that mm -hmm. level of maturity, that experience, 
you know, success comes in layers. Success doesn't happen all at once. It's something that happens over time in many, many layers. I mean, you've just built and, you know, have, have had a great experience with your entrepreneurial venture. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden there was just this big inflection point and everything just happened. You know, it's like, yeah. it happens over time in layers to the point where like, by the time you get to that big success, it almost just feels like the next thing, you know, it's not like For some sure. massive thing that's, wow, a meteor just hit the earth. It's more like, no, it's just the next logical step because you've got so many, you've got thousands or tens of thousands of steps behind you at that point. And so yep. yeah, I think that's what comes with experience and decades is just that ma maturity and that precision. Well, even how you just articulated the journey of a human through their sort of creative potential or the uh, outward manifestation of their creative potential through different projects is like there is a wisdom in what you just you talked about being able to put words to things that other people are thinking and that that it's not just this winner take all meter hits the world one hit wonder that it's a tent and it tends to be and is i mean i don't have any experience um personally and i know very few who truly were one hit wonders they had some sort of you know, there was a long road and that's just not something our culture talks about, but that makes me, you, you know, you're, you're, you left me an opening there about some of the contributions that you have made to the lexicon. Um, let's start with that. Like, what do you think some of your, you know, most impactful work has been? And specifically, if you want to talk about the daily creative, you know, new book out, um, great. We have lots of time to get to that, but what do you think are some of your, um, you know, what is this, the describers, what have you, what have you, what do you feel like you are able to help people understand about their own journey that as they are experiencing that, that they might not be aware of themselves? Yeah. Well, so I think one of them is actually in the subtitle of daily creative, which is giving creative pros a target to aim for, um, which is, you know, the subtitle is a practical guide to staying prolific, brilliant, and healthy. That's a framework that I've been using for a long time with creative pros and with managers. Listen, there are three things mm -hmm. we want to aim for all at the same time. We need to be prolific because we got to keep pace. We have to keep up with the demands of our clients, our market, the marketplace, the organization. We have to be able to keep up. So you have to be prolific to be a creative pro. Brilliant, meaning we want to do good work. We want to do work that is on par with or better than what our competitors are doing. And so we have to do mm -hmm. good work. The third piece is the healthy piece, which means we also need to figure out a way to work sustainably. Okay. And I think often we sacrifice healthy on the altar of prolific and brilliant. And so we go through these cycles of crash, burn, refresh, crash, burn, refresh. And over time, people gradually become increasingly efficient at doing decreasingly effective things. The reason being, whoa, 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 whoa say that again. They become increasingly, increasingly efficient at doing decreasingly effective things, meaning they're cranking <laughs> stuff out. They're keeping pace, but their work either is subpar or they're burning themselves out or they're, or they're reducing their, their output in order to try to maintain some degree of sanity in their life because they haven't built the infrastructure necessary to support their creative ambitions. Anything in your mm -hmm. life that you want to accomplish, anything, I don't care what it is, you know, whether it's starting a business, storming a beach, doesn't matter. Anything you want to accomplish requires infrastructure. You need to have a process. You need to have all of the systems in place, the resources in place to support that ambition. If you don't, it's not going to succeed. The same thing applies to our creative process. You need to have some practices, some rhythms, some infrastructure to support your creative ambitions. The problem is most creative pros that I encounter are, or at least most creative pros who don't think it through are just winging it. They're showing up every day and they're relying on their talent to get them through. But talent is gets you a seat at the table maybe, right? But your daily practices are what keep you in the game. So your talent might get you a seat at the table for a while, but your talent, your talent is not going to sustain you over the course of a career if you have to produce day after day after day. Eventually, it's gonna be the people who have some practices and some infrastructure that will eventually over time will begin to separate themselves from the pack because they're gonna be mm. dependable. They're going to deliver and maybe they don't have as much sheer raw talent as somebody else, but when it comes down to who am I going to work with the person who gets it right one out of every five times, cause they're shooting from the hip or the person who just consistently delivers over and over and over again, 
I'm going to work with the professional, right? So um, that really is kind of, I think one of the core things that really has been useful to people in my work has been that framework of prolific, brilliant, and healthy, meaning that we're working in a sustainable way, which means building some practices to keep us at the top of our game. That is going to be the cold open to the show right there. I just decided <laughs> like that is just like most creative professionals and you, uh, whatever, just to the, to the, to the team that's producing these, just go back, press play. That is like the best entrance into your, into your work. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's beautiful. Now let's dissect this a little bit, okay. Todd. Prolific. Yeah. You, you, you just listed those things, prolific, brilliant, and healthy. Brilliant. I think people, that's obvious, right? You need to be great at your job. But let's talk about each one of these in successive. Great. Uh, I would. I think they they layer not too dissimilar to success in general. They layer onto one they another. Do. But this idea of let's let's explore your rationale for each of these things. Great. Now, why would someone need to be prolific? Is you know in their creative pursuits? Why does that matter? What if I, you know, make a great album? or write a great book that sells a million copies. Can't I retire on the back of that book? Why, you know, why, why prolific? So, I mean, the answer to your question, of course, is yes. I mean, if you write a great, you know, you write a book and it sells millions of copies and your ambition in life is just to retire, go for it. That's totally fine. I don't think that's going to be a very satisfying life if, you know, your ambition is just to do one creative project and then retire for the rest of your life and play golf and surf and whatever else you're going to do. As human beings, we're wired to derive a sense of meaning, of identity, of even purpose from the value we put into the world. So we are wired to create value. And when we don't understand the deeper theme or the deeper meaning behind that value we're creating, our even success can feel hollow, you know, in that case. So if we have, you know, most one hit wonders that, you know, we've, we were talking about that earlier, like most people who have that one hit that hits, first of all, you can't control that. I mean, usually when that happens, it's because market forces aligned and yeah, it was probably a great product, but market forces aligned and it just, boom, it just took off and caught and nobody knows why and nobody can explain it. Nobody can replicate it. It just happens. Um, and I personally, I think that's wonderful when that happens. And I think also then what do you do next? What's the follow-up to that? I think becomes the, the paralysis, right? That's why you have a lot of bands have that sophomore slump where it's like, we had our entire life to write our first album, but now we have like a year to write our second album. And oh, by the way, we're touring, we're on a bus, we're, we're trying to write the album while we're touring and playing the old music. And we're trying to write some new stuff. And so they, in the middle of the show, they're like, hey, let's play a new, hey, we're going to play a new song. We just wrote and everybody's like, boo, right? We want to hear the old <laughs> stuff. Anyway, um, you know, I think that's part of, you know, when we talk about infrastructure and writing, that's why the best bands, the best musicians, the best writers, they never stop. They don't stop. They just keep going. They keep working. They keep producing. And listen, not everything they make is great. And they don't maybe even put everything out that they write, but they keep producing. That's part of their practice, part of their rhythm. If you want to make, if you want to produce a lot of good stuff, you have to create a whole lot of good stuff, far more than what mm -hmm. you put out there. So some of you know, people talk to me all the time about how, you know, wow, you're so prolific. You're so prolific. I'm not, I just make a lot of stuff. And some of it I share. And it just happens that I make way more than what I actually share. Or I spend a lot more time writing than what actually goes in my books. Um, if you want to be a professional creative, then as Austin Kleon so eloquently put it, and I accidentally ripped him off once and put this on Instagram and didn't realize till later. And I apologized to him in person. I'm like, I totally stole your thing. I'm sorry. And then I went back and I revised it. But you need to focus on doing the verb, not the noun right? Don't worry about being the thing. Do the thing that that person does. So if you want to be a writer, you have to write. If you want to be a musician, you have to make music. You know, if you want to be a, a leader, then guess what? Start leading where you are. Don't wait for somebody to anoint you. Start leading. Do the verb, not the noun. So when we talk about prolific, that's what it is. It's just about doing the work. Um, now, there are some things mm -hmm. we can do to help us get there. Um, there are five key categories that I often focus on focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, and hours. They spell the word fresh. Uh, this is from the book, the accidental creative. So for example, with prolific, 
how you define problems becomes really critical. If you have to do a whole lot of work, you better pretty well doggone know what it is you're trying to do, which means you need to be able to define those problems that you're trying to solve very precisely and very effectively, you know, rather than sort of wallowing in the uncertainty of it. So there are things that we can do to help us be more prolific, but prolific really at the end of the day is about being a professional, being able to produce at the capacity you're capable of producing and to do it consistently over time. Um, obviously prolific is tied to healthy. We're going to get to healthy in a second, but I'm going to play back to you. The ability to be prolific, to make a lot of work, share, um, share a lot of work and have that repeating. There's some systems. So let's talk about a little bit of the systems that support of being a prolific creator. Yeah. So a couple of things, first of all, um, we, our creative process is only as good as our creative inputs. Again, a lot of people shoot from the hip and they expect ideas to just come up in the cracks and crevices of their life, but they're not taking the time to fill their mind with valuable stimulus that could turn into valuable creative throughput. It's not even output, it's throughput, right? It comes in, it gets combined with other things, and then it becomes useful in our process and it becomes creative throughput. But people are less than purposeful about the kinds of things they put in their mind. So people spend all day, and listen, there's nothing wrong with scrolling Instagram, nothing wrong with scrolling, you know, looking at reels or doing whatever. There's nothing wrong with any of that inherently. But the problem is that it lacks purpose. We're not seeking stimulus that really helps our creative process, that really is sharpening our mind, allowing us, as Stephen Sample, the former president of USC, called it communing with great minds, right? We're not communing with great minds, which means we're not training ourselves to think systemically. The best creative ideas come when we combine something from our discipline, a problem we're trying to solve with something from our discipline and something from way outside of where we normally would look for an idea. And suddenly we have this aha moment. And usually we think those things are just completely accidental. You know, there's nothing we could have done to control that. But the reality is it often is because we have experienced something, whether purposefully or not, that inspired us in some way, forgot about it maybe. And then two weeks later, there's another insight that we have that aligns perfectly. It dovetails perfectly with that other insight. And the combination of those two things sparks a breakthrough for whatever project we're working on. Well, we can do that intentionally. You know, we can intentionally structure that kind of stimulus into our life, or we can go out looking for it. You know, for example, I have led many teams on uh, photography exp expeditions uh, to go solve problems. So I once did this with a, a brand that was trying to come up with new ways of talking about what they do. And I broke them up into teams of five. And I said, you're to go out into the neighborhood and you're going to take five photos. Each team takes five photos. And those five photos have to tell the story of your brand. So take photos of whatever you see, but it can't include any words and it can't include any symbols that you already use, right? So go out and do it. And they came back and we had like seven or eight completely different articulations of the brand story. We had new imagery, we had new metaphors, we had new everything because I forced them to go out and pay attention to the environment and to see what the environment sparked. If we just sat in a conference room and I said, hey, come up with seven different ways to talk about your brand, we're all going to roll to the middle of the bed. We're all going to say the same stuff, right? But forcing people out into the world opened up the way that they thought about what they do. And so we can do that every single day in our own process to help us generate ideas. We just have to be disciplined enough to do it. So it means reading, studying, having time dedicated to absorbing stimulus, going out and observing the world, taking notes, you know, thinking about the problem you're trying to solve. Go for a, people talk about going for a walk. It's not that walking is magical. It's that you experience the world in a new way when you go for a walk, especially if you have a problem in mind that you're trying to solve. So those are all things that we can do to help us in advance of that moment when we need to have that brilliant breakthrough. Amazing. This, and this is a good time to inject again, what we're going through right now is prolific, brilliant, and healthy. It's three sort of cornerstones of, um, an amazing creative life, creative human experience, and also happens to be the subtitle of your new book called daily creative, which is 366. Um, would you, what would you call them? Um, aphorisms, essays. essays. Okay, great. Yeah. Essays, yeah. uh, 
that are, you know, I will use these words quick, focused, inspiring, and actionable. So Mm -hmm. the, just as a, to support what you just heard Todd talk about with this, this being prolific, what I admire about the book is there are very practical, (laughs) actionable um, examples you just use, you know, very simply going for a walk and why going for a walk is valuable, not just the walking, but the thinking during walking. Like those are, that is part of what, um, you know, I think I take a lot of questions as do you on, gosh, how to have a successful, you know, creative career, life, et cetera. And there are, I only call them hacks. There are practices that are just plain helpful to this process. And, you know, you've just acknowledged those under this sort of the three buckets that I want to look at your work through this prolific, brilliant, healthy. Um, that is one of the things that I appreciated, you know, and I see some of my own habits in there. I I picked up a couple of new ones from the from the work, but it is, you know, this is a just a great time for me to give a plug to the book, Daily Creative. Go get it. It's paperback, which is nice. It's not a forty dollar. It's not a forty dollar book. Um but, and that was intentional as well. I mean, everything yeah. about this book has been intentional, right? Like we wanted to make it accessible. We wanted it to be something where you can buy three or four copies for mm-hmm. the for what you would normally pay for one copy of a hardcover. Yeah. Like we want it to be something that feels like something you're going to pass around, that you're going to use over and over and over again. That's going to be something that's going to be a part of your life. And if you lose it or it gets destroyed, you just go buy another one. That's totally yeah. fine. It's not like super expensive. And there's a reason for that. My, my ambition with this book was to create a cadence of creative professionals all over the world, having the same thoughts and the same conversations on the same day over and over and over again. So in an organization, you know, today's um, essay was about crafting accidents. It was kind of like what we were just talking about, right? Like about crafting those creative accidents with a specific challenge for how to do that at the end of the essay. Well, man, if you have an, an entire team of people who are having that conversation and talk about how can we structure our environment to facilitate more creative accidents. I mean, that's going to be really powerful. So it, the goal is not just for people. Listen, I have no ambition to sell books. So, I mean, I know that probably sounds like BS, but it's totally true. I have zero ambition for people to buy my book and sit it on the shelf where it looks pretty. I, I have no ambition of that. My ambition is for people to read books and apply them because I want to create change. I want to create a cadence of change. And so you know, over the last couple of years, I'm sure you've experienced as I have, uh, a lot of people have felt like a little bit like they're drowning, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. been very uncertain. I know the marketplace has been a little bit weird and people have been trying to figure out how do we work from home and now we're sort of starting to transition back. And um, it's it's almost like, hey, you ran a marathon, congratulations. By the way, now it's time to strap up your uh, spikes for the hundred yard dash, right? It's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I think that's kind of where people feel like they are right now. And you, know, when somebody feels a little bit like they're drowning, the last thing you want to do is throw them a manual to teach them how to swim, you know, which is, I feel like what writing a book and, and dropping it to people would be like, Hey, here, read my 300 page book about how to deal with being creative every day. And then let's see if that helps you while you're drowning. No, you jump in and you pull them on the boat. And so I wanted this book to be a very low bar for people who maybe want to have some practice in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, two minutes of reading an essay and thinking about a prompt every Mm -hmm. morning, but the impact of that two minutes could be exponential if it's practiced consistently and far more than exponential if it's practiced by multiple people together on a team. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the net result of that could be huge. Yeah. Love that so much. And prior to us hitting record, um, we were swapping notes about uh, the title being a daily creative and that I, I am a big believer in this idea of creativity as a, as a daily, likely hourly, but a daily, daily practice. And I have having created some things in uh, YouTube, for example, under the heading, the little micro show called the daily creative, same thing. How can we like take questions, answer those questions and have that be a low bar? Like what's a five minute thing? Or in your case, you know, a very short a two page, one page thing where you can actually get value and apply it such that you don't have to park a weekend or, you know, God forbid more trying to consume a whole volume of stuff. And it's like the equivalent of what, you know, watching a, a short, a short video or reading this. I, I just love that as an idea. So kudos to you for 
not throwing us a manual for how to swim while we're drowning. <laughs> well, <laughs> like and, and also analogy. kudos to you because I and we talked about this a little before we started. I I wasn't aware of that, oh, the fact I, that you had that going on. And, no, and, this uh, is, so I you know, don't. I, 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 stop, I it, don't stop it, stop it, stop <laughs> it, stop it. Not gonna have it. Not gonna have it. Yeah, these these con these are concepts basically. This is not yeah. uh, this is not ownable. These are beautiful concepts. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna shift over to. I'm gonna go. Ironically, I'm gonna jump from prolific to healthy. I was actually gonna do these things. I'm in my notes here. I had it in reverse order, but. Uh, I'm going to go to healthy here because you've just opened that little door. I'm going to walk through it. The idea of it. We just came through a pandemic say largely that was an unhealthy experience for most. And, I, and yet I do know some people are like, wow, it was great. It was quiet. My nervous system was regulated. It just, you know, I was staying at home and not commuting and, and there are virtues to both, but I can, I think it's fair to say that we are, we have at least, you know, come through together a very strange experience. Yes. that definitely cultivated to you know to some some unhealthy um spaces mindsets habits uh for a lot of people maybe not everybody but let's let's talk about that let's talk about this healthy you mentioned earlier burnout i have shared publicly as of this um recording that uh, I'm, I have left creative live now. It, it has had its, its full, it's, um, it's full cycle, right? It was an idea. Uh, we got together, we launched this idea, grew it. We brought in venture funding, you know, 10 X, the thing had tens of millions of people using the product and made, you know, you know, just, it was a very full experience. Sold that to a public company. And <clears throat> here I am sharing that you know, while I've been on, you know, this was a, all part of the process now after, you know, contributing a year to inside the public company to help it be successful. I have been tired for, you know, I would say the pandemic and, and even this, you know, this process of getting, you know, your baby inside of a larger organization and thriving is tiring. And so when you're talking about burnout, I'm thinking about my last two years and all of the things that I didn't do that would normally be a piece of my psyche. And I'm sharing all this in hopes that people who are listening or watching realize that you're not alone, that I make the show <laughs> twice a week basis. I'm, I've been freaking tired. Mm -hmm. And I, ironically right now, you know, as I'm you know, sailing into a new chapter, I have new energy, but the burnout was very real. It was, yeah. I would say prolonged. Um, I had, you know, my mindset was definitely affected through this process. So having healthy be a part of what you've written about in this new book and what I, you know, I've, we've had conversations offline before about this. Can you please orient us I'll say me, but hopefully this is a benefit for the listeners as well, watchers. Sure. Um, orient us about what it takes to stay healthy in this era where yours truly, and I'm guessing millions of others, just feel a little beat down. Yeah. And listen, there there is so I want to be careful to parse these concepts of tired and healthy, right? Okay. Um because you are going to feel tired from time to time. If you're doing work that you care about, mm -hmm. um, you are going to have to walk through some things in order to see that work accomplished. The difference, though, is when, A, you have an unhealthy attachment to those outcomes to the point that you are spending energy you don't have in order to accomplish them. That's that's one thing. And, and even sacrificing things that you shouldn't be sacrificing for the sake of that. Um, like your long-term health. And we all know entrepreneurs who have done that, who have become very, very sick and mm -hmm. even to the point of death because mm -hmm. they were too overextended for too long of a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, or when your burnout begins to affect the prolific and brilliant pieces of your work, meaning you know, eventually, I mean, you're not a machine. I'm not a machine. We're, we're all going to crash if we don't take care of ourselves. We're not wired to operate indefinitely at that pace. 
So I'm not saying by healthy, I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying don't stretch yourself. I'm not saying there aren't going to be seasons where you are, you feel overextended. You feel out over your skis for a season, but that word season is really important because on the other side of that, you have to have some structure. There has to be an ebb and flow to protect you from the crash and burn that is inevitable if you're not, if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Um, this word, so we often talk about this word passion, you know, and people talk about following your passion. And I, I don't necessarily disagree with that phrase, but I really strongly disagree with the way that that phrase is used because people talk about follow your passion as if it means follow your interests, follow the things you like, follow the tasks that you enjoy doing all day, right? Um, and that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the word passion actually means. In its root form, the word passion means to suffer. It comes from the word pati, which means to suffer. So follow your suffering doesn't quite have the same ring to it as follow your passion. But that's really what we're telling people when we say follow your passion, meaning I care more about an outcome than I do about my temporary discomfort. So I'm willing to walk through a season of discomfort if necessary to get to an outcome that matters more to me than my temporary suffering. So that kind of follow your passion means I'm willing to suffer in order to achieve a result. Great. Love that. That's fine. That cannot be forever. There has to be a bounded season in which you spend yourself in that way or else you will eventually crash and burn, you will not achieve the result that you're trying to achieve. You simply won't because human beings are not wired to be able to sustain that indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So we have to have seasons of extreme engagement, spending ourselves, getting out of our skis, and then recovery. Um, the marketplace doesn't like that, Chase. Uh, the marketplace wants equal input, equal output. There's a dynamic I wrote about in the Axel Creative called expectation escalation, which is something like this. It's like, hey, Chase, um, Way to hit your numbers last quarter. You not only hit your numbers, but you actually did 125% of your numbers. That's amazing. By the way, 125% your new baseline, right? Oh, hey, Chase, you not only did 125%, you did 140%. That's amazing. Way to go. We didn't even know it was possible. By the way, 140% your new baseline. And we slowly ratchet up the expectations to the point that it takes everything we can do just to hit our bare minimum expectations, once people discover you can do something, they expect you to do it every time. It doesn't matter if you work nights and weekends, you know, for weeks on end in order to make that happen. It doesn't matter. Once they know you can do it, they want it from you all the time, which is why having some boundaries in place. And I talk about this with leaders all the time, making sure that you're setting some healthy boundaries for the people on your team, because you can do that once you can do it every so often, but you cannot expect that of your team every single time, or you will lose them. They're going to feel like you're throwing them under the bus and you will lose their trust and you will lose them forever if they feel like you're throwing them under the bus. So this dynamic of staying healthy is really about having rhythm. It doesn't mean don't work hard. It doesn't mean don't expend yourself. It means pursue your passion, understand what you're willing to suffer on behalf of the outcome, but also recognize that there's a finite amount of energy you have to spend before you are operating in the red and your engine's going to blow. You have to have some rhythm of recovery in your life. You know, this is, you know, let's borrow from ancient wisdom, you know, ancient wisdom, the, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, one day a week, you are ordered not to do anything right in ancient, uh, in ancient wisdom in, in, uh, the Jewish tradition, right? The Hebrew tradition and the Christian tradition, um, you are not to do anything one day a week, nothing. And even, I mean, in, in the ancient world, they took this to extremes. Like if you do anything, if you like you know, lift your fingers to go do something. You're like, it's like a no, no, you don't do that. And, you know, there are a lot of rabbis who have written about this over time, which I find really interesting. Um, and one of the insights is, you know, it's kind of there in some ways, the, the Shabbat, the Sabbath is there to remind you that you're not the center of the world, that the world goes on just fine. If you don't work for a day, if you don't do anything for a day, if you just kind of let things happen, it's funny, the world just continues to spin. Everything goes on just fine. We can easily convince ourselves as creative pros that if we stop striving, that the world is going to stop spinning. If we stop striving, our clients are all going to leave us. If we stop striving, we're going to get fired. The reality is that striving, not working hard, but striving might be the very thing that's preventing us from achieving breakthroughs in our life because we don't have the rhythm that we need to be able to produce consistently great work, but to do it sustainably. So 
that would be my encouragement to people is to build some, build some boundaries, build some rhythms into your life to ensure that you have seasons of recovery on the other side of your exertion. This concept of seasons is something that I have relied on. Uh, I can say probably forever. And it comes out of my, as a young person, um, in sports, right? There was soccer season and there was off season and I sometimes played football, you know, in, in junior high and high school. And those were alternate. They, they, in my school district area, they were different times of the year and there was things called the off season and you did different things in the off season, lifted weights, jogged versus did, you know, high intensity training or so this idea of rest and recovery has been a part of the athletic mindset for some point. You don't, there's a reason that pro football teams play 16 games and they don't play every week year round because they get busted up and torn down and they have to rest, recover, go away, re-strategize, make new plans, fix themselves, you know, fix their mindset, manage expectations, health, all these other things. And this is, and yet we struggle to apply that to our professional lives. Regardless, I mean, we're talking specifically on creators because of the the demands that you know you you write about at length in your work. But same is true in life. Like that's you you know you mentioned the Shabbat. We I've just come off of the, one of the first real vacations I've had in years, and it felt incredible. And you know now I've yeah. returned with a lot of energy and you're like, gosh, why do we forget this? Why does this disappear? And, and it is, it's a matter of social input and expectations and expectation escalation, as you talked about. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's uh, interesting you say that. So I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, you, no. you mentioned your vacation. Um, so our family went to, Fra this, this sounds a little like, oh, on my yacht, let me tell you what happened on my, you know, it sounds a little <laughs> like that. That's exchanging vacation stories. Right. But, but like we, my family went to France this summer for vacation and this was, um, my, my father-in-law is French and we really wanted our kids to see France through his eyes. Right. Um, we wanted them to understand, um, the you know, family history and all that. Amazing. And like yeah. his, fa his father was like, um in charge of, I think, all of Eastern France for the French resistance in World War II. So like about as French as you could possibly get, right? Uh -huh. um, pretty incredible. And so um, what's interesting is we had all of these really long meals. Um, we drank a lot of wine. Uh, we ate a lot of pastries, as you would expect in France, and spent a lot of time walking and doing other things. Um, it was a fundamentally different kind of rhythm that we lived. You know, I have three kids who are teenagers. One of them's in college now and two are in high school. And, you know, our lives are very frantic and we're often like struggling to have 30 minutes for family dinner in the evening. And here we are having like three hour meals in the evening, just sitting and talking like late into the evening and hanging out. And I expected to come back and have gained like ridiculous weight. And I actually lost like six pounds while I was over there. And I think a big chunk of it was just the taking taking more time to be present in the place and enjoying what i was experiencing and experiencing a different rhythm than we usually experience here in the us right which is mm -hmm. very much about like the event the transaction you do the thing and then move on to the next thing and that was very much not the rhythm there and so i came back with a completely different understanding of how life could be done in a new way um, not a better way necessarily, right? I mean, there are pros and cons to every culture, but it's funny how when you get outside of your rhythms and your routines, you realize, oh my goodness, I have developed these ruts around what I think is normal. And there are entire cultures in other parts of the world who have thoroughly different understandings of what rhythm looks like and what culture looks like. And that was, that was invaluable for me because I realized, oh, uh, Case in point, um, our our one of the guides that was with us on the on the tour said, "Well, what do you do if you're not like if you don't eat three hour dinners starting at seven thirty p.m. or eight p.m. Like, what do you do in the evening? You know, what you eat at five thirty or six? They were asking you know, people in our tour group, and they're like, "Well, you know, we eat at five thirty, and then well, she's like, "Well, what do you do?" And she's like, "Well, I guess we watch TV, right? <laughs> like that's what some people were responding in the in the group, or we find something else to do." 
Whereas, you know, in French culture, it's like you eat and that's like the conclusion of the evening. Like you eat dinner and then you go to bed. That's what you do. You know, it's just sort of like you enjoy each other's company because the day is over. And so anyway, I think there are new ways we can learn to be human. And I think that's a big part too of how we bring ourselves to our creative process because you can't parse your personal life from your professional life. You can't parse personal commitments from work commitments. Mm -hmm. You sit at the center of all of those things and you spend energy in all of those places. And so I think we need to, we need to ask ourselves, what is the right rhythm to position me to be able to deliver the things that matter when I need to deliver them, whether that be with my work or my family or wherever. And we need to be open to the idea that there might be some people who have figured some things out that maybe we haven't thought of before. And what you do a nice job of among the many other things is reminding us that this does not a license away from hard work or committing deeply or even uh hesitate to say over committing but just going really deep and then resting like this most other cultures also take a large part of august off you know and right. the french are the french uh, are another example of this like this going working really really hard and then taking some time that is a part of a rhythm that is not really a part of most of the work culture of the people who are listening to the show right now that's so. right well let me let me give you an example of how that plays out on the work front right um for for me and it's something that i've taught many leaders and and pros as well is um you know th this book was a little different in that I had a short time frame to write it and it was very different because it's I'm writing like essays I'm not writing like a big concept book but when I'm writing a book, I will discipline myself to write 500 words a day. That's what I discipline myself to do. Now, the discipline isn't in getting to 500 words. The discipline is not writing more than 500 words because I want to write 1,000 words. I want to write 2,000 words, right? Because I've got a big idea. But I know if I write 2,000 words today, I'm going to be exhausted tomorrow and I'm not going to feel like writing. But I know I need to write every single day. So the discipline part of it isn't, oh, I've got to gear myself up to write 2,500 words. No, it's I'm going to write an amount that feels maybe like it's a little less than I could and discipline myself to stop while I still have energy so that, A, I have time to think and I can also pick up tomorrow where I left off. I can begin with or end with the beginning in mind, right? It's sort of the way I always, I always like to put that. Brilliant. And for those that are like worried, uh, let's just be very practical. Like, oh, well, if I take time off or if I, my clients are going to leave me because I'm an independent professional and I make my living on the schedule of others. That's part of the reason, ironically, that I didn't, you know, went for a very long time without taking true vacations. And the way that I, the lie that I told myself was like, oh, well, you know, if uh, one of my major clients calls, then, you know, I'm at their beck and call. And if you say no, you know, they're going to go somewhere else or, um, you know, and that's not saying I didn't, you know, but it was like, oh, when I finish a job in New Zealand, I'll stick around for a few extra days and, you know, go to the spa and, you know, do the hike that I didn't get to do as a part of the project or, what, you know, all these lies that I told myself. But then mm -hmm. I keep reminding myself of Stefan Sagmeister. I don't know if you know, one of one of the best designers in the world who ironically was always uber talented, but actually... And he's been a guest on the show. It's a great episode. He talks about, yes. I actually became famous for being the guy who took one year off every seven years to go recharge my ideas and, you know, reimagine the work that I was doing and go study abroad and, you know, walk the earth. And, and so, and all that did was make him more well-known and more in demand. So this idea that, that we're this sort of scarcity mindset that we have around working all the time actually is there's some fundamental errors to that which you wisely point out in in the book i think it's a good point now to shift and and go back to brilliant because staying healthy you know being prolific doing a lot of work you know i understand how staying healthy relates to that but let's talk about being brilliant like don't we all want to put great meaningful valuable enjoyable work out in the world what you know what have you learned in your work and working with, you know, you talk about teaching other leaders, being a creator yourself, combating burnout, you know, what is sort of a, a daily toolkit that will contribute to brilliance? Yeah. Um, so we talked about talent earlier and talent is obviously a key factor 
in our ability to do great work. Uh, it's hard to do great work if you don't have some degree of talent. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to do it. But I think another thing that often causes even talented people to get off the rails and not produce up to their capacity is this dynamic that I call delusion, uh, which is when we begin to believe false narratives about who we are, about what we're capable of. And we begin to try to do things not because they are in our wheelhouse or because they're part of our ambition set, but because they're what someone in our situation would do in our situation. I had a great conversation with Richard Heitner from uh, Saatchi and Saatchi. He was the global vice chair of Saatchi and Saatchi. And in the conversation, he was talking about uh, different aspects of his career. And he said, you know, I, I kind of grew up in this environment where everybody said, if you, if you really want to succeed, you have to be the person who wants to be in charge. If you don't aspire to be the CEO, there's something wrong with you. If you don't aspire to be the top dog in your industry, there's something wrong with you. And he said, I had that opportunity and I realized like it, I really wasn't very good at it. I wasn't very good at being the person in charge. He said, but you know what I'm really great at? I'm great at being the number two. I'm great at being the COO. He called it being the consigliere, right? Like from, uh, you know, from in the <laughs> Italian. He said, I'm great at being number two. And he said, it took me a long, long time to figure that out, that it's perfectly okay for me to be a person who is suited to be, to, who has the talent to be the number two person because number two people are really important. But everything in the marketplace screams, you gotta wanna be number one. You gotta wanna be the person in charge. Well, I think a lot of creative pros do this, right? And this plays into this expectation escalation thing as well, where not only are other people imposing expectations on us, but we impose expectations on ourselves. We're constantly comparing our in-process work with the absolute best thing that's ever been done ever in the history of our industry, right? Forever and ever, amen. And it creates a kind of paralysis where we don't allow our work to the, the luxury or, or the benefit of process, we expect everything to come out of the womb fully formed. And that's not the way creative work happens. And so over time, our work suffers or we give up on something before we achieve the, the level of brilliance that we're capable of because we are artificially escalating our own expectations of what it should look like. I was leading a team, wow, 25 years ago now. Um, that sounds like a really long time. When you were six. was. When I was six, when I was six years old, um, and you know, my 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 wonderful wife had purchased for me uh, a set of the Think Different campaign posters from the Apple Think Different campaigns. I've always been a huge Apple freak, like even before Steve Jobs came back. Like I loved Apple. I've always been an Apple fan. Um, and she bought for me a series of those posters, the original posters, in like a little book. And so I thought, hey, this would be really cool if I like put these posters all over our office, right? It would be really inspiring for people. So I put the Alfred Hitchcock poster outside the, the offices of the videographers, right? Right outside their workspace. And one day I got a knock on my door, you know, I'm just sitting there and I was like, hey, what's going on? And this guy came in and he said, hey, you know that Alfred Hitchcock poster that you put up? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, can you take it down? I'm like, why? I thought you loved Alfred Hitchcock. And he said, well, I do. He said, but... Every time I'm making a video edit, I'm sitting there and I can just feel Alfred Hitchcock looking over my shoulder and judging every single edit that I make, right? It's like having one of the greats looking over your shoulder and judging you. And this reminds me of the Stephen Nakmadovich quote from uh, Free Play. He said, it's great to sit on the shoulders of giants, but don't let them sit on your shoulders. There's no room for their legs to dangle. And I think that's what was happening in this case, right, is that this person was comparing their work with the absolute best work of their hero. And so we have to be careful not to let that happen because then we don't allow process to play out. We forget that even that brilliant work that we admire was once very unformed and mid-process. And that person was probably doing the exact same thing, comparing their in-process work with the work of their heroes. Um, so we have to just let the work play out if we want to achieve our potential as creative pros. Mm. So brilliant. This brilliant but bumch this um the concept of knowing that what you're putting out might not be brilliant i find keeps a lot of people stuck mm -hmm. what are, what's you know what are some ideas that you have that are adaptable and adoptable right yeah. now for listeners and watchers when how you know this sort of the this duality this um 
collision of the fact that what I am about to send to the client, what I'm about to show my boss, what I'm about to share with my community is not brilliant. Right. And yet, well, first of all, let's, let's recognize that very little work actually is what we would call brilliant, right? It can be really, really good, but brilliant is sort of, that's a word that I use because it's sort of a little bit provocative. Um, but you know, what we're really aiming for is really good and really effective, right? That's what we're aiming for when we're, when we're doing creative work. And that, so I sort of use that word brilliant to describe work that's really good and really effective. Um, couple of things on that front. The first thing is we have to recognize we are often the absolute worst judge of the quality of our own work. And when we are sitting in our own little bubble trying to identify how good something is or isn't, um, you know, we tell ourselves all kinds of stories. We have all kinds of ghost rules that we follow about what we should and shouldn't do or what is and isn't acceptable. And so we have to be careful not to fall prey to that, to, to being the only person with eyes on our work. We need other people in our life we can talk to and share things with before we go public with them, before we share them with our boss or our client or whoever. And one great question to ask is, if you were me, what would you do with this? Right? Don't say, hey, is this good? Is it not good? Say, hey, if you were me, what would you do with this? Um, it's a great question to ask because they're going to immediately jump in and start saying, well, I might do this or that, or I might change these things, or maybe this word, this phrase doesn't really make sense to me or whatever. So they'll start, you know, offering you feedback, just, you know, and that, if you ask them, is it good? Nobody wants to insult you, right? Um, so if you were me, what would you do with this? And the second thing is, you know, what's something obvious I don't see? Is there anything obvious that you see that you don't think I see about this? What am I maybe overlooking? Um, those are two great questions to ask. We need other people in order to produce our best work. You know, creativity is groups of people stumbling awkwardly into the unknown together. That's what we, that's what we do. And so we need other people to help shed light on it. And that's really, in my opinion, that's the best medicine for self-doubt is having other people in your life who can speak courage into you, who can encourage you. In other words, put courage into you. Brilliant. Um, very tactical point here for the listeners and watchers and specifically uh, in regards to your, your book, which is the foundation, the background of what we're talking about now, um, the daily creative and one of the things that I appreciate and I was hoping you could just comment on is at the end of each of these essays, <clears throat> and to be fair, they're quick and short and very um, tight. There is a question. And mm -hmm. one of the questions um, I'm looking at a particular page right now is an example of like, and this is January, right? It's, it's new beginning, new birth, new rebirth. You know, you're on the cusp of inspiration because it's the new year. And there's a question at the end of like, what is on your quote, this would blow my mind list. So yeah. I'm wondering if, you know, it seems like this is the right weight thing. Some, you know, I've been asked by publishers and agents and, and the community to like, Oh, you know, give us some daily journal, some prompts. And anytime I look at those things, there's always like, dude, who does this much work every day where you have to like trot out your backpack and revisit your childhood in order to get through your morning routine. And yet I find these questions, these uh, call them prompts, but I'll just say questions that you have like that's, it is just a, it's like a kernel of thought. So mm -hmm. a, from a creative process, like, holy smokes, coming up with that many of those that must have been so difficult and how did you land on what to me appears like just the absolute perfect depth it's just enough to, enough to nudge your thinking and it's not two hours worth of homework yeah well first of all I, I wrote it for professionals right and to your point professionals have things going on in their life you know believe it or not people have other things going on than like dealing with my book every morning so i wanted it to be something that almost like framed up their day um it would be enough to get them thinking enough to kind of challenge them in some aspect of their creative process and by the way the the weeks aren't themed the months aren't themed i mean there are some themes that you'll find in them and there are definitely themes that we come back to over and over but one of the greatest um 
one of the greatest tools in the arsenal of the teacher is surprise. And so I want people to be caught off guard each day by what the topic is. I find that that's often something that allows me then inroads, it allows sort of a little foot in the door to begin, uh, you know, sort of teaching them or helping them transform in some way. And so as you go from day to day, there isn't some, it's not like this week we're talking about focus, right? Because then tomorrow you're going to be like, okay, great. I got to read about focus again. But instead, if it's like, Today is what would, you know, what's on your blow your mind list. And tomorrow is about like questions that you should be asking. Maybe, maybe obvious questions you're overlooking. And the next day it's about, you know, um, Hey, here are three ways to spark an idea today. You know, I wanted it to be something that would be very unique and very different for people. Um, but to your point about it being hard. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a challenge. You come up with 366 unique <laughs> ways of talking about something, um, and at the same time, you were really talking about like the 366 maybe best kernels of insight over the last 20 years of my career. And so mm -hmm. to some degree, yeah, but also I think the harder part was maybe figuring out which 366 I should use. Um, that was maybe maybe the more challenging thing. And it's sort of that, you know, that that old saying of like, I'm sorry, if I'd had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. That's kind of how I feel about this book. You know, I could have taken five years to write this book and distill it down to just the absolute most essential stuff. Um, but unfortunately, as a pro, like all of our listeners right now, um, you know, we don't have that luxury. We, we have to, we have, we have boundaries and deadlines. So, um, but yeah, to your point, it really is just about making sure that we're giving people enough to, to frame up their day and maybe throughout the day they'll experience stuff that will cause them to think about this prompt throughout the course of their day. Um, but not so much that it feels overwhelming because I don't want homework. You don't want homework, right? I don't want no. homework. We don't, who has time for that? Well, that's what I've always feared around these, you know, the daily things. And I, you just stri stricken, 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 struck such a beautiful balance. And so mm -hmm. gratitude for what you've created for, uh, the creative community. Thank you. Um, and just a congratulations again. We're talking with Todd around the daily creative. It's a paperback book available now, highly recommended 366 essays, uh, that help guide you bite size essays where you're not having to, you know, walk through the swamp of despair every morning or over the course of a weekend or a month to try and come up with your, opus it's just a beautiful lightweight way to keep going so thank you Thanks, and thank by the way that was that was the alternative title was swamp of despair we chose <laughs> not to go with that one but <laughs> it was sell a lot of sell a lot of books that way um no just grateful for you and your work you are you know as you articulated in your opening just you've done such a nice job attaching you know concepts and or, or a lexicon and to, to these concepts that we all feel, you know, in, in the, uh, particular lies the universal. And so you keep doing what you're doing, man. You're so good at it. And, um, thank you for being a repeat guest on the show and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for all the great work that you do and have done over such a long period of time. Uh, I feel like we are brothers in arms in this space. Indeed. And so thank you for the kind invitation and thanks for all the impact that you've had and congrats on all of your success. Oh man. This is about you folks. Let's celebrate Todd. Uh, support. The book is incredible. I think it's like, uh, I'm looking at Amazon right now, 16 bucks, best 16 bucks you could spend. Um, congratulations again. Thank you. Let's go out and support Todd rally behind he and his ideals. And where else would you steer people to pay attention to your work Todd, on an ongoing basis besides just the book? Yeah, you can go to toddhenry.com. That's my personal site. You can find out more about my podcast. We have the Accidental Creative Podcast since 2005, every week, uh, new episodes. So, um, and you've been on the show. We're yeah, be indeed I have. I'm, soon, look, so. I'm looking forward um, to it. Yeah. So toddhenry.com is the best place to go. Sweet. All right. To everybody out there in the world, the creators, entrepreneurs, uh, thank you so much for paying attention to the work that we do here at the show. Be sure to support Todd. And until next time, from Todd and I, we both bid you adieu.